Hello everybody, Greg is here. I took a week off and uh, that means I had some time to work on a video and uh, here it is. And this time it's about a potential solution to a climate change perhaps or not, we'll see. I will not make a, a big introduction about climate change. Uh, I, probably everybody who watches this channel knows that there's a greenhouse effect and that was uh, drives the temperatures up and blah, 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 so on and so forth. And to solve this problem, people looking for a technology that could capture carbon dioxide from air to reduce the greenhouse effect, of course. And this is the exact technology that was just published in Nature by no one else but those two corresponding authors, Omar Yagi and Joachim Sawyer. So before I go into chemistry and other measurements, a few words about the authors. So Omar Yagi from Berkeley, he will probably receive a Nobel Prize one day for the development of uh, metal organic frameworks. Those are those porous, tiny sponges that you can control their chemical composition and uh, the pore size and so on. And Joachim Sawyer, he's a computational chemist and uh, maybe he more known for being husband of uh, ex-Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel. So in general, there's many authors with uh, seven affiliations course from Berkeley and from Germany but you can see that also everybody who is from Berkeley they are affiliated with KACST which is an office of Berkeley in Saudi Arabia and I'm not sure why Berkeley decided to open a center in Saudi Arabia but I have some personal experience when I was doing a postdoc in University of Toronto a lot of professors got funding and were affiliated with uh, Saudi universities I'm not sure what uh, was the scientific contribution of all this. I know that uh, those professors were uh, going to Saudi Arabia, living in very expensive hotels, uh, giving a few lectures, eating very expensive foods, having lots of fun. And uh, I guess that was the majority of the contribution of uh, Saudi money to uh, the scientific progress. Also, they funded some specific projects inside those universities and their agreement with the university allowed them to review the CVs of people who they hired to those projects. And obviously that resulted in uh, some discrimination, which also obviously contradicted with university policies. But let me know in the comments if you want to hear more about it. But let's get back to science or engineering part of this work. The goal was to develop a sort of nano sponge or not necessarily nano, but sponge that selectively soaks carbon dioxide from air. And that's a very challenging task, of course, because it's not that you just need to selectively absorb the carbon dioxide and not absorb the other gases in the air. It should also be recyclable, robust, so you not just use it once and then throw it to garbage. You should be able to capture and then to release it at relatively low temperature so you don't waste energy. And there's many other requirements. I will not talk too much about the chemistry of they did. And again, let me know in the comments if you want me to talk more about chemistry because they used known reactions. They don't invent any new reaction here. Right, so they made this three-dimensional uh, material by uh, making a condensation reaction between those two building blocks. Okay, this is the three-dimensional material. They show only one cell, but you can imagine that it, it actually continues to all three dimensions. That's three cells. And then they post-synthetically modified it by reaction with a zeridin here that it has a lot, a lot of free amines here that is, are able to react with carbon dioxide. And okay, the average pore size is 3.3 uh, nanometers diameter. And if you look in the microscope, you get pretty similar particles with lots, lots, lots of those pores inside. And the particle average size is five micrometers. If you do the calculation of how many of those pores is in each particle, you get to around one billion per sphere. If you look at the uh, chemical uh, modification, uh, so around 66% of those R groups were converted into amines and uh, approximately 4.6 aziridins were attached to each of the reacted amine side chains. That's from spectroscopy. And okay, 
So we have the material, which is supposed to react selectively with carbon dioxide. And let's see how it does it. So they did lots, lots, and lots of measurements. I will not show all of them. Selected ones, let's go over what they did. First, they tested each gas from air separately. So we have the uh, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, oxygen, and argon, and also water, but we will come to water. You can see here that carbon dioxide definitely have much higher affinity to this material than any other gas. And that's a closer look to the CO2 absorption in this region. However, also water has a very large absorption to the pores. And uh, that was their concern that water may interrupt with the absorption of the carbon dioxide, but actually not. It didn't happen. The effect was the opposite. So here's the absorption of carbon dioxide and water at once when they mixed in the same gas mixture. The water vapor with the carbon dioxide and first water getting absorbed and then after some time carbon dioxide become absorbed. Only after the water already reached the plateau. And here you can see that the higher the humidity of the mixture, the better the absorption of the carbon dioxide is. That means that water actually supports the carbon dioxide absorption. And that's the dynamic of the absorption. They also studied, of course, the desorption, how fast it can be desorbed. 60 degrees is enough to get the CO2 released from this material, which is pretty remarkable. The temperature is very low compared to any other methodologies that were trialed before. After one hour at 60 degrees, you can see that all the carbon dioxide is gone. And here, this graph shows that after 10 cycles of absorption, desorption, nothing happened to the covalent organic framework and it can be reused more and more. But those experiments were done with controlled amounts of carbon dioxide, which are close to what is expected to be in the air, but that's not the real air. That's all, you can say, synthetic air. So in the next part of the research, they did the experiments with air itself. They just put it in the room with some airflow. They measured the concentration of carbon dioxide in the air. Also, they measured the humidity. And they made 100 cycles here, 100 cycles. And they didn't see reduction in absorption ability of the material. So it can be reused again and again and again and again. And after 100 cycles, you can see there's no difference. All, the, all those differences between the different cycles is based on the concentration of CO2 and the humidity. Here's the microscopy of uh, the as-synthesized material and the... Uh, after 100 cycles, you see there's no difference also visually. Poros swears here, poros swears here. Those are the computational uh, results of what exactly ha happens with carbon dioxide, which structures does it form inside those pores. And they also made a comparison of their material with all other materials that were tested before this publication for the same application. Not many of those materials were actually tested in open air. So that's this. Uh, that's the material that they have. You can see there is no anywhere you see open air, maybe he only here and here. But in those cases, the material were either not stable or, oh, here's also open air. It was used only for one cycle. So it wasn't like capable to be recycled again and again. Or, or it was, it required very high temperature to release the carbon dioxide. So for sure what those guys did here is superior to any other thing that was done before. What makes this their material so superior? And they list listed here. So they used the, the hydrophobic building units and that's why actually the water that uh, the humidity from the air do not interfere with carbon dioxide but it only supports its absorption and also uh, lower carbon dioxide regeneration temperature is needed here. Also, in contrast to previous publications, the initiators are covalently bound to the framework and that's what makes it uh, so strong and uh, recyclable. Also, the olefin linkage, that's the double bonds here uh, between the aromatic rings, that would also make this structure very hard, robust. A really cool work, but uh, are we close to a solution of climate change problem? with this uh, beautiful material. Well, I did some brief calculations and you can do the same calculation by yourself. To solve the problem of the greenhouse effect, we need to start removing 10 gigaton of carbon dioxide annually from the atmosphere. 
So from uh, those brief calculations and from the uh, activity of the material that uh, Professor Yagi, Sawyer and co-workers did, it would require about 60 megaton of this material. Even if all labs in the world just start synthesizing it, it will not be possible. For, ex for comparison, if you do the global paracetamol market, which is much easier to synthesize, much cheaper, is only 145 kiloton per year. Of course, it can be useful, for example, for some uh, small factory who wants to reduce its carbon footprint. It can buy a kilo of this uh, COF 999 and it will help them to capture the carbon dioxide. Not sure, however, how much carbon footprint would leave the synthesis of this uh, framework by itself. So bottom line, climate ch change is still with us, so we should brace ourselves and maybe we'll have some palm trees growing up in Canada after all. One last thing to uh, to show what was the contribution of uh, all the people. I mean, everybody were doing something, of course. Some people were synthesizing, some people were anal analyzing, some people were uh, designing and so on. But uh, those two guys who are affiliated only with Saudi universities, all they did was provided valuable suggestions throughout the study. <laughs> If I would be a co-author in all papers to which I provided valuable suggestions, I think my Hirsch index would be close to that of Omar Yagi and Joachim Sawyer. And by the way, of course, they registered the patent here. Probably will make some money or not. Who knows? When I was working on this uh, video, there was this argument in the popular science YouTube between uh, Sabine Hosselnferger and Professor Dave about uh, science in general and science popularization in particular. And I'll probably make a separate video about it. Just wanted to draw your attention uh, here. The truth, I am closer in my views to uh, Sabine Hosenfelder and I disagree with Professor Dave, but we'll talk about it separately. So thanks for your attention. Please support Ukraine and support ceasefire in Israel and the return of the hostages. Let me know in the comments if you want me to make more videos or want to talk about some other specific topics. Have a nice day.